If you're not already subscribed to this YouTube channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button now, along with the bell icon so you can be notified whenever a new video is posted. And if you're already subscribed, check and make sure that YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you. And of course, be sure to give the video a like, as well as share it on your social media. The white supremacists hate that. Now, that said... The white media's been spending a lot of time trying to redefine what is in our interest. They spent hundreds of years dictating to people what to believe, particularly black people. They've had it all their own way. So when the black grassroots began flexing our muscle, taking the mic, and defining what our interests are on our terms, the white media knew that they had a problem. They knew that we weren't about to listen to or have any respect for any of those bootlicks, any of those old Negroes who have been carrying water for white supremacy, any of the clowns who have been calling themselves selling us out just so that they could get gainful employment from Massa. We wouldn't listen to them. We're not playing the game. As Khalid Muhammad beautifully put it, I don't want a job from you. I don't want money from you. I don't want a contract with you. I don't even want contact with you. In a nutshell, that is the threat that the new voices of black media pose to white supremacy. We're speaking to the people, and there's no way that they can buy us off, and they don't have anything that we're interested in. We're here to take from them, not to be part of them. So what they're trying to do is do an end run around us by, first of all, trying to define what reparations is, taking all of these trick bags and lies and all of these deceptive, deceitful ploys calling that reparations when nobody else does. The white media tried to see if they could ignore us out of existence, because that's what they're used to. They're used to the idea that if they don't acknowledge your existence, well, that means you don't exist. Nobody else is going to hear about you unless the white media mentions you. But what they found was the black media had already reached the black grass roots. The revolution would not be televised, and it wouldn't be presented to you by the New York Times either. So, seeing that apparently the black media would not be ignored out of existence, the white media decided to try their next strategy, which was to wait us out, to see if our momentum would flag and fail. But what they found out with the Democratic primaries in 2020, when we crushed Kamala Harris and crushed Michael Bloomberg and led the charge to put Jim Crow Joe on the defensive, what they found out was these new voices of black media out here talking about tangibles and reparations and punishing the police. They were gaining ground, and more and more black folks were talking like them, and the old dead black media who are having their death rattles right now, the roly-poly Martins, and the other suck-ups like the Don Lemonades and the Joy Reeds and others, these clowns were desperately trying to slightly, very slightly, talk like us and pretend as if they were part of what we were doing just to see if they could peel off any of our listeners and viewers, but they couldn't. The people weren't fooled. The black media's message has staying power. Oh, what is a white media mouthpiece to do? What they've been trying to do is they've been trying to basically claim that reparations has already happened. Notice they don't say slavery reparations. They just say reparations, which could mean anything or nothing at all. And that's the entire point. Same way that with Val Demings, they started throwing around, she's a descendant of slaves. Again, we keep it nice and vague. CNN put out a propaganda piece today saying, Massacre survivors, lawyers demand Tulsa be the next city to pay reparations. Well, that's two lies for the price of one. First of all, nobody's paid reparations. What they've been doing is they've been trying to see if they can get away with some hush money. We know what reparations are. We define that. The white media doesn't say what constitutes reparations or whether or not something counts. We do. And second of all, this is pretentious and presumptuous as hell. It's a bald-faced lie. The next city to pay reparations? Uh, yeah, because they've just been lining up, right? That's what it's supposed to be. Well, oh, these niggers, you, you guys are getting what you want. Why? We say that, that the, the next city to pay reparations, well, you guys have just been winning, you know? You, you guys shouldn't have anything to be mad about. Why? People, they've done right by you, so you, you need to stop all that talk about reparations, you know? They're doing right by you. 
The white media realizes that even though they have the ability to carpet bomb the people with their propaganda and lies, the problem is they've been hearing what the people have been saying and the people ain't falling for it. The black media has gotten to the people and let them know this is a trick bag here. We define what reparations is. We all know what reparations are. It is cutting the check, which is the very thing the white supremacy is determined not to do. So you might wonder. Now, before we go any farther, black folks have a bad habit. Call it post-traumatic slave disorder or what, Willie Lynch chip or whatever you want to call it. We got a bad habit of basically always checking with Massa to see if what we're doing is okay or checking with Massa to see if what we're doing has any sort of consequence or not. And that's a bad habit we got to drop. Your oppressor is not going to be basically telling you, hey, you guys are having the intended effect. You don't look to Massa to figure that out. We have to get comfortable with doing the hard work of performing our own due diligence. We have to get comfortable with gathering the data on our own and trusting our own abilities and our own skill and our own experience at being able to determine whether or not what we're seeing is actually factual or not. We got to get comfortable with that again, instead of always looking and seeing uh, who's the nearest white supremacist that I can find to tell me whether or not I'm right or not. Because what we're really doing is looking for their approval. We got to get over that. But for the folks out there who do wonder whether or not even Massa understands the threat that they're under, they understand it very well. NBC, of all people, they put out a story yesterday about reparations, quote unquote, their definition of it. And even they were forced to have to admit that the black folks at the street level, they're looking and going, this stuff ain't no reparations at all. Headline, NBC News, the country's first municipal reparations program is off to a rocky start. The rocky start, of course, is coming from the black community themselves. Now, I'm going to read most of this article, so just so you understand, we're going to be quoting largely from this article itself. Recently, Priscilla Giles, a retired teacher of English as a second language in Chicago public schools, said she has been feeling something between sad and angry. Three months ago, the city of Evanston, Illinois, where Giles was born and raised, approved the first local reparations program in the country. The city announced its first phase would pay black Evanston residents who experienced housing discrimination $25,000 in the form of home improvement costs, down payment and closing cost assistance, and mortgage payments. Now, you guys know what the black media told you about that. That ain't nothing but a housing program, which, by the way, largely applies to everyone. It's for underprivileged people, which means white folks, the same ones who benefited from white supremacy, they're going to be eligible for it, too. They just say, well, if black people can sign up for the program, well, that means it's reparations. Anything is reparations as long as black people are admitted to. As long as black people can apply for it, too, then we say that's reparations. Well, it ain't reparations if everybody gets it. And housing, a little old housing voucher, the damage done to us was not merely done to the black folks who were in the killing fields of the American South, not merely those who had to survive Jim Crow and the black codes and the redlining and such, but also their children and progeny, those of us who are suffering today because it never stopped. The racism and bigotry and, and the killings and discrimination never stopped. So let's not pretend as if, oh, we can limit this to a specific time frame within a 20 year period like hell you will. But also, it hurts black folks because of the multiplication effect of accumulated generational wealth. By denying us generational wealth, we've also been denied the accumulated multiplied effect of generations who have been able to store up and save and build upon what their ancestors passed down to them. Every black generation has had to start from zero because of the fact that white supremacy made sure to take everything that each generation might have hoped to have. It wasn't just the survivors of the Tulsa Race Massacre, or the Rosewood Race Massacre, or Red Hook Summer. It wasn't just one generation or even two or three generations of black residents in Evanston who were robbed of their generational wealth. It is every black generation since the 16th century. And a phony baloney $25,000 housing voucher was supposed to make black folks go, Ooh, we, we get reparations. See, that's what the black baby boomers were about. 
Forget about the millions that you're owed. Instead, 25000 for a housing voucher. Oh, that's good enough. But the black media message has gotten through because the black folks in Evanston said, no, nah, we see this trick bag. Priscilla Giles is black and lived in the city from 1919 until 1969. She is automatically eligible, but she said she is reluctant to apply. And why is that? Well, as she said, it's not reparations. And that's for sure. Now, you got this woman here. She ain't a black baby boomer. She happens to be from that turn of the century generation. She happens to be from that World War II generation of black folks. I guess that's why she ain't talking like the black baby boomers. So Priscilla Giles, she's sitting here saying, this ain't no reparations. Oh, yeah, see, black folks supposed to see some white folks sit here and go, here's one or two pennies, nigger, and we're supposed to get happy and jolly in the behind and going, finally, we'll take it. That If that's all we can get, we'll settle for that. If that's all we can get, we'll settle for that. We'll, we'll just settle for that. Yeah, that black, that black baby boomer talk. Yeah, but it seems that there's some black folks in Evanston who ain't suckers. The article goes on to say Evanston residents have been debating the details of its current reparations program for more than three years. When the legislation passed, it was deemed a blueprint for the rest of the country. Gee, every time they talk about black folks and some program that's supposed to be a blueprint for the rest of the country, that usually means, hey, here's the latest trick bag that we're going to use to screw black people over or to try to do black people in. And this pilot program of oppression, this is going to be a model for the rest of the country. Hey, the rest of the country, take a look at what we're doing to screw black folks over in this city or in this state. Hey, the rest of you go ahead and pass some laws following suit. That's what it means. They're sending out the clarion call. Here's the latest measure to try to screw black folks over. That's what that means when they say blueprint for the rest of the country, because nobody has ever had anything that would help black people that they have trumpeted as here's something the rest of the country should do. No, if it's something that helps black people, they immediately look and go, whoa, we got to stop this. This has to be stopped. Black folks are benefiting from it. This is something that needs to be. We have to put an end to this before it spreads. But the reason that they were pointing to this was, hey, if black folks are getting on a tear and they're starting to get on code and they're getting organized behind tangibles and saying that reparations, not just for slavery, but for the accumulated racism and oppression and deprivation of resources that we've suffered since, if black folks are saying that this is going to be our issue as a unique racial ethnic group in this country, that's dangerous. So what we got to do is, if the white media has failed to redefine reparations, what we're going to do instead is we're going to say, okay, fine, then we'll do it, we'll do it. Hey, here's your reparations. They're, what they're trying to do is they're trying to short circuit this entire debate that we've begun. They're trying to short circuit this economic revolution that they see forming underneath their feet. They're trying to short circuit it and try to find a way to do an end run around it by proclaiming that at the local level, we'll claim that housing vouchers, we're going to say that this is reparations, even though it applies to everyone. And we want the rest of the country to understand if we can't stop the niggers from talking about this, if we can't stop them from demanding it, if we can't stop them from organizing their vote or lack thereof, around the issue of their tangibles and forcing the cities and states and country to cut that check, then what we're going to do instead is we're going to pull a game, another game and say, here's a blueprint program. Here's your reparations. Okay, fine. Then we're giving in. See, we're giving in. When, of course, they're giving nothing at all, just like that crap in California. And of course, as we all know, as goes California, so goes the nation. Now, the article goes on to say hundreds of black residents have rallied behind the online group Evanston Rejects Racist Reparations to demand that the program be paused and reevaluated. Now, that organization, what they're saying is that this housing voucher nonsense, this is a trick bag and black folks see through this. We'll be talking about them in just a moment. But to continue, the city gathered community input on a local reparations plan. Now, we, of course, know what that means. Black folks show up and say, here's what it should be. And the white city council members or the white elected representatives, along with their black flunkies, say, OK, we're going to we'll nod our heads with them. We're going to tell them, sure, sure, we'll listen to you. Then as soon as they're behind closed doors, we ain't doing none of that. 
Whatever these niggers have said, we're not doing any of that. And their black flunkies will go, yes, Massa, you show right. I hope you I hope y'all give me some pennies so I can make it to the state legislature, whatever other kind of political job y'all going to give me. Because God knows I need it. It's Cedric Richmond is basically what you got. Too many black politicians in this country are like Cedric Richmond. So the city council went ahead and held a phony town hall. Yeah, you guys show up and tell us what it is you think. We're going to pretend as if you guys are involved, as if you're going to have any input. But no matter what you say, we've already made up our minds what it's going to be. So the city council put on some political theater to make black folks in that in Evanston think that they were being involved when it was obvious from the start they had already made up their minds that they were not about to cut the check. They had made up their minds about this housing voucher scam a long time ago. The black community's input meant nothing. But, speak of the devil, one of their little city hall, town hall meetings that they had, why, who would show up other than Danny Glover? Yeah, like a bad penny every time we look up here, that fool comes. Just like he did for that phony baloney reparations hearing for Congress back in 2019. Danny Glover, I guess he's supposed to be. See, that's the thing. A lot of black folks, as soon as they hear some black actor comes to town or some black singer. Ooh, I just go. I just want to turn out to see what he has to say. And that the white supremacists play on that. Once they got your nose open that, oh, I'm going to go show up and see if um, see if Tom Joyner's going to be there. There's a spotting of Di of Danny Glover at the city hall. Oh, the Negroes will show up and they'll just be putty in this bootlick Negro's hands. That's what the idea is. And they'll show up and feel good about the trick bag that these white supremacists are trying to put them in. According to one of the attendees, I'd never seen a turnout in Evanston that big in my whole life. All 700 seats in the First Church of God were full. Yep, you can't have something like this go down without the pork chop preachers. Oh yeah, every time it's time to mislead the black folks, every time it's time to screw black folks over, make sure that you have some pork chop preacher on, on tap, some pulpit pimp who's going to be selling the white supremacist soap. But uh, were the black residents buying? Fake reparations. Residents voiced their opinions on how the reparations should be distributed during monthly subcommittee hearings. The city-led discussions quickly turned away from cash payments to a housing assistance program. Now look at that wording. The discussion quickly turned away from cash payments. When black folks showed up, they said, cut the check. See, that's what Danny Glover was there for. Keep in mind, it was only in June of 2019 when he went to give his disgraceful display at that so-called reparations congressional hearing. So a few months later, what a surprise, he turns up like a bad penny in Evanston. So he was making the rounds. Obviously, this dude was put on out there by somebody who put the battery in his back so he could go ahead and do this nonsense. But the residents weren't buying. The city council made it clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We heard you guys say cut the check, but uh, we got an idea for a housing assistance program. Hey, you guys will just be glad to get whatever we're handed. Now, ain't that what these Biden, black Biden supporters were saying? Well, they ain't got to cut the check. We should just be glad for whatever we can get. We just be glad for whatever we can get. Because it's going to be that or nothing at all. White supremacy counts on that. Black folks have shown for five centuries now that we have been consistently inconsistent. We have not been persistent. We have shown that we're ready to cut and run the moment that Massa looks and goes, well, we can't do that. Okay, Massa, please. Just anything. We'll settle for anything. We'll settle for anything. And they want to see if that would happen this time, but it didn't. Article goes on to say, Cannon said from the community's standpoint, it seemed the program was being shaped without locals' input. 
Well, I can go ahead and take the supposition out of that one. It had already been formed long before the first city town hall had been held. They already made up their minds before they even told you, hey, let's hear from the public. They already made up their minds long before exactly what it was going to be. They just wanted to see if they called you in and pretended as if they were listening to you. Could they get you to go ahead and settle for this? Because psychologically, you would already have made the devil's bargain with yourselves to just settle for whatever they would say because you would have already given up could they psych you out it turned out the black folks couldn't be psyched out in evanston so easily now next they give a quote from kirsten mullen and william darity yes i know but he's in the article so we got to mention it they say this is a housing voucher program not reparations and calling it that does more harm than good now, as with so many other things, and this lets you know how this is how that whole um, a dunce crowd, how the white media has no problem quoting them and some of their fellow travelers. And that's how you ought to know that there's already a problem here. Now, apparently, Darity and his friend said that reparations can only come from the federal government. Now, I disagree with that. and We should all disagree with that right off the rip. All of them owe. The cities owe because they were the ones who carried out the racial massacres. They were the ones where the killing fields were actually set up. Where these concentration camps calling themselves plantations actually were set up and operated. The states were the ones who filled their coffers with it and wrote the laws that were supposed to give a framework for our deprivation and denigration. And the federal government of the United States not only derived the income and the tax money, which made it the wealthiest nation in the history of the world off of our uncompensated labor and our continued financial deprivation, but they also pegged the value of the dollar to all of that free labor that we provided. We made them the wealthiest, most powerful nation in the history of the world. All of them owe. Reparations can come from all of them and are owed by all of them. I ain't ruling out anybody. I'm not going to sit here and say reparations can only come from the federal government. Damn it. The local, county, state, and federal authorities all owe because all of them were part of it. All of them benefited from it, so they all owe. Reparations are owed by all of them and should come and must come from all of them. I'm not letting any of these bastards off the hook. Oh, but they did make sure to drop in H.R. 40. You see how that con game that Square Jaw and Mushmouth pulled years ago? You see how the white media is trying to take that ball and run with it? H.R. 40. All it calls for is a committee to study reparations. It doesn't call for a study of reparations, even though that would be a joke. They didn't have to have a study to figure out whether or not Asian Americans required some sort of financial check for them due to COVID. They didn't need a study for that. Didn't need a, a bill to be passed. They just said, here, we're going to cut the check. But this is about trying to shore up Sheila Jackson Lee's image, trying to repair the damage to her image, because everybody's already staking out that, hey, all of these um, immigrants and all of these bootlicks from abroad that you keep importing, these guys ain't going to be part of that. They ain't got nothing to do with them. Yeah, the imported bootlick class that the white supremacists have tried to place over us, the Sheila Jackson Lees and the rest of these clowns, they're looking and going, we got to find a way to try to shore up their image. We need these guys to mislead these Negroes. And, the, and these people have already rejected them. Why? How are we going to keep these people corralled if we don't have our slithering bootlicks slithering amongst them, insinuating themselves into the black people's affairs? They're putting their heads together and they're coming up with all of these ideas without listening to our bootlicks. They're not listening to the messy Jessies. They're not listening to the Barack Obamas. They're not listening to the Sheila Jackson Lees, the controlled opposition, the phony baloney, supposedly pretend black leaders. Damn right we're not listening to them. H.R. 40, it was TBA himself who did a brilliant dissecting and takedown of that con game, still available to watch on his channel, which you should. If you haven't checked it out, go check it out. But H.R. 40, here it is. 
So even while this article pretends to give minor mention to how black folks are saying, hey, we see through these trick bags, they still try to find out how can they prop up one or two of their little ploys. Hey, here's H.R. 40. They don't point out that H.R. 40 does not have support by black folks. They don't point out that H.R. 40 is not reparations at all. Instead, they try to pretend as if H.R. 40 somehow has been stymied for 32 years as if passing H.R. 40 somehow would be a win for us. Now, next, the article goes ahead and states that black folks ain't going for the con game of this housing voucher and expels out exactly why it is, or at least in part, they, it's very brief. And by the way, the fact that they let this get through, that lets you know just how vociferous and how passionate the opposition to this fraud really is. Because if they have the, if they decide to print this, you have to wonder, man, how bad was the real stuff that the black folks were saying? The article says residents, notice they don't say black residents. All of a sudden we got to be race neutral. Residents opposed to Evanston's plan say it puts too many restrictions on how they can use the money. Renters, for example, can't use the housing assistance because it's only for current and future homeowners. Cannon's opposition began when she contacted her broker about potentially purchasing a home using the allocated $25,000. She learned it wouldn't be enough to cover a standard down payment on an average priced home in Evanston, which is currently more than $400,000. So you got trick bag on top of trick bag on top of trick bag. Most of the black folks in Evanston happen to be poor. So that being the case, they are poor or struggling financially. So that being the case, most of them are not going to have the money necessary to scrape together a reasonable down payment on a home or a down payment at all, and certainly not be able to keep up with the mortgage payments on a $400,000 home. But just in case there happen to be a, a few of them who do have that kind of scratch put together, well, this ain't for renters anyway, so that $25,000 doesn't apply to most of the black folks in Evanston. And for the few who it does apply to, well, it wouldn't be enough to cover a down payment anyway way so it's practically useless now do you think that the white authorities in evanston hadn't already crunched those numbers long before they hatched this lying fraudulent plan you think that they hadn't already figured that out you think that they just happened to pick twenty five thousand dollars out of the sky no they looked and said we need something that even if they do manage to get it hell it wouldn't do any good anyway and speaking of not doing any good, the article says another problem residents point out is that because banks and real estate companies would have to be involved, the program privileges institutions that have historically been the agents of discrimination. A community organizer is quoted as saying the beneficiaries of this program would be those who initially did the harm of redlining here in Evanston. So there you have it. What we have been saying here clearly has made it to the black folks in the street. They're pointing out the very people who hurt us in the first place, the very people who discriminated against us and deprived us of our resources and our rights. This is a program meant to distribute wealth, not to us, but to them, the very white racist bankers. And the realtors and such, the ones who discriminated against us, this is meant to be a big check to them. They're the ones who are going to get the money. This doesn't put money in our bank accounts. It just puts more money into the bank accounts and coffers of the financial institutions and the racist realtors. This is just one big check to them. So the money doesn't go to black people. It's going to be going to the very white racists who discriminated against black folks in the first place. But the black residents are pointing that out, making it clear. We see exactly what this is. This is one group of white supremacists in the Evanston City Council giving black folks tax dollars to their white supremacist pals and the banks and the, and the realtors organizations. That's all it is. That's it. Well... No wonder they hope that this will become a model for the entire country. Now, the article then goes back to Priscilla Giles, says, 
Although she is planning to apply for the $25,000 funds, Giles said she believes reparations should benefit the whole community. During the town hall meetings, residents have advocated for building affordable housing and community land trusts in addition to cash payments. Now, you notice how the white media phrases that. Oh, during the town hall meetings, the black folks, they said that they, they want housing and community land trusts. They're trying to prop up this whole phony lie that, well, what black folks really want are housing vouchers. Notice how this article is trying to substantiate the idea that, well, even though black folks are opposed to it, they actually want it too. No, what they did was they wanted the cash payments. See, that's how the white media works. They take what black folks really want, and if they have no choice but to report on it, they downplay it. They bury it in the article. They try not to mention it. Meanwhile, whatever it is that's in white supremacy's interest, that's what they give all the attention to. So what this sentence actually means is, during the town hall meetings, black folks said, cut the check. They said that they're not opposed to affordable housing. That's fine. Land trust, that's fine. But the main thing they wanted was cut the check. Giles is later quoted as saying, I want the city to move in a way that future generations would benefit from it. There you go. Generational wealth. The very thing that white supremacy has been dedicating itself daily to making sure that black people are locked out of and to make sure to keep it out of black people's hands. And the white media has been trying to sell the lie. Any line of garbage that they think is going to get black folks off their square and trick them into accepting some sort of trick bag. The article goes on, of course, to give a lot of attention, a lot more attention to the right wing nuts who have decided to sue the city as if somehow this some, somehow that uh, black folks should be ashamed that there's other groups who are opposing this reparations plan. The, these right wingers, the same ones who, by the way, filed a lawsuit on the behalf of Asian Americans against Harvard University. Of course, they don't point out that Asian Americans are minorities, quote unquote. Don't they feel strange about being in bed with these right wing racists? See, they don't do that. But instead, it's a matter of, well, these black folks who aren't grateful for what these good white supremacists on the Evanston City Council have come up with this whole housing voucher scam. I mean, scheme. I mean, a uh, plan to give money to the banks. I mean, to help black folks get uh, down payments for homes. Why? Black folks, they have put themselves in the same camp as these right-wingers who are opposed to it. The article spends a lot of time mentioning that. See, they don't spend any time on black folks' cash reparations demands. They don't spend any time on that. They give one or two minor mentions to it buried in the middle of a sentence, but they don't go on about, well, you know what? This would all be a lot easier if they just cut the check to black folks and black folks will decide what to do with it. Instead, it's a matter of, no, we're not cutting any checks. You can't spend the money for what you think it should be spent on. Instead, it's just going to be a housing voucher so you can give it to the nearest white supremacist who owns a bank or white supremacist who owns a realtor's office. And only a few of you will have access to it anyway, so... The article eventually closes by quoting Mrs. Giles as saying, I can't say that I was any more angry or surprised than when I first heard that the reparations were going to be given for people to buy houses rather than for something benefiting the whole black community. Because whoever got the money, it did not benefit me or mine. There you go. You got this grand old woman here. And the article says that she lived in Evanston since 1919. That's 102 years ago. So it's interesting. You got all of these black folks, not the baby boomers, mind you, but you got all of these black folks that 100 years old, it, you can feel the hand of the ancestors keeping them around because they're the ones saying, here's how the deal really went down. And no, we didn't like none of that mess. See, the black folks who actually understood that getting white supremacist acceptance, that ain't the deal, we're hearing from them now. They're very elderly, but they're still able to say, hey, here's what it was a hundred years ago. How different they speak than the black baby boomers. This is the reason why I don't give the baby boomers any doggone respect. They completely turned their backs on and spat in the faces of their parents and grandparents. They betrayed the revolution.
Well, we're not. See, there's a reason why reparations and tangibles, that whole issue went dormant from the 60s up until today. In fact, before that, because the people who were supposed to take the ball and ran with it, they put the damn ball down and said instead, can I have a pat on the head? Uh, can I get a job working close to some white supremacist? Oh, please let me be able to join some white supremacist racist sorority or fraternity or if I can get into the Elks Club or something. Please let me get close to mass and that'll be good enough for us. That being the case, you got Generation X and the two generations afterwards. You notice how we're very different. We're cut from the same cloth as that World War II generation, the ones before. That's the cloth we're cut from. See, even if you got a generation that decides they're going to turn their backs on what's right and spit in the faces of their parents and their children, if you got a generation who's got their heads on straight, you can actually hand the ball off to your grandchildren and your grandchildren will be the ones who run with it. I am honored at the fact that what we have done, many of the people who started this whole thing, they're still around to see it. They're around to see their chil- their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren do what their own children failed to do. But understand something. This is what the trick bag is. This is what the ploy is. This is what the plan is. This is what they're going to be. They're telling you this is what the blueprint is for the rest of the country. We're going to come up with some bullcrap plan, plan for housing vouchers. Yeah, so that the racists over at Chase Bank and over at Bank of America and over at um, over at Capital One, we can go ahead and give money to those guys. That's all it is. A massive redistribution of the wealth plan to the very white supremacists who created the problems in the first place. And we're going to call that reparations. Oh, and in case black folks, in case black folks decide to get wise to the scam If they don't fall for this little cock and bull story, then we'll say why you guys take a look at these right wing racists over here. Why they're opposed to this plan. So if they're opposed to it, shouldn't you be for it? Yeah, they're trying some Jedi mind trick and going to see if some Negroes are gullible enough to go for it. If you guys are not grateful for whatever little fraudulent crumbs we throw your way, whatever little planned double cross that we got in mind for you if you guys won't fall for that under the banner of well i guess we might as well take it it's the best we can get if you don't fall for that then we're going to point to these racists over here the donald trump maneuver is what this is we're going to point to these racists over here and say aren't you scared that these guys are going to get over on you and if they're opposed to it doesn't that mean that you're wrong These white supremacists aren't opposed to it because they have a problem with black people getting something out of it. They're opposed to anything and everything that has black on it. Anything and everything. Just because some white supremacist nutbags who oppose anything with the word black on it on general principle, just because they sit here and say, we don't like this. That doesn't mean that I'm going to be looking and going, oh, well, I guess I, sh- I guess I should be going for this just because. See, as Neely Fuller put it, white supremacy believes in taking both sides of the argument. They believe in being the ones holding the trick bag with a $25,000 check for the racist banks. And they also believe in being the ones saying, well, we're not sure that this is a good idea. So no matter how things shake out, no matter who loses, white supremacy always wins. But notice that at no point does this NBC piece ever blame the white leadership of Evanston. At no point do they say, you know what, the residents are saying cut the check. They should have just cut the check. They never say the blame for this lies on the white leaders of Evanston. All they had to do was cut a check. The residents are in agreement on that. But as a matter, that's the whole point, though. They want to make sure it's understood. Uh, well, cutting the check. Well, you see, black folks believe that cutting the check could be, but that's not really what they want. It's actually about anything other than cutting a check to them. That's what the white media's lie was meant to push. That, well, with these black folks, as, as it doesn't have to be a check. In fact, it shouldn't be a check at all. But what they're finding out is if it ain't a check, black folks are pointing to this and going, man, this ain't nothing but a damn trick bag. Black people are going to define what reparations are. Not some black bootlick. I posted for you earlier today on my Twitter feed how you got messy Jesse. 
Oh yeah, when he's not sitting here trying to find some staff worker that he can snuggle up with. Or find some white supremacist who's behind his lips can be super glued to. What he's doing instead is he's finally crawled out of whatever hole he's been hiding in. And he made his way, he waddled his way to Tulsa. So he can stand in front of the cameras next to people holding reparations now signs. Now, Messy Jesse, all the decades he's been out there, how ha, has he ever gone hard in the paint for reparations? No, what he's been talking about instead is inclusion, inclusion. Reparations is about having our own. When you have your own, you ain't got to be worried about whether or not some white supremacist accepts you into whatever they've set up for themselves. You have your own. You got the opportunity to have bigger and better. But Messy Jesse ain't about that. He's still talking that he's still talking that damned integration. And we y'all need to include us too. see this. Is what, while you got the real ones like the Priscilla Giles talking about, hey, you need to be cutting that check. Here you got those civil rights retreads like Messy Jesse. And I call him a black baby boomer because he is. I know some moron out there is going to try to split the hairs and say, well, you know, the baby boomer generation starts exactly in 1945. Shut up, fool. I'm not cutting the bastard needs slack over four damn years. Shut up, fool. But Messy Jesse was in Tulsa because at this late date, He's still standing here looking pathetic and sorry as hell. I've been saying for decades now that I am somebody. I I am somebody, but, but these young folks, they're telling me that what I am is irrelevant. See, there used to be a time, and the white media loves the idea, that black folks would sit around waiting to see when one of these bootlicks would do something. But instead, what's happening is black folks led by the black media are saying, no, we're going to take charge of the discussion. And what you see is you see the messy Jesse's and the Al Sharptons and the other bought and paid for bootlicks. Now they're chasing us. Now they're following us. The pork chop preachers and the pulpit pimps and the rest of these fakers, frauds, phonies and fools. They're sitting here following us. They're following the work that we put in. Messy Jesse ain't the one who was talking about any of the race massacres. You ain't never heard that bastard mention them. No, he ain't mentioned that at all. He'll run over to Bosnia and try to get in front of the cameras there like he did in the 90s. He'll go to North Korea and say, I'm going to negotiate to try to get some hostages back. He'll do that. But when it comes time to go ahead and headlock some of these white supremacists and some of these do-nothing Negroes in the Congress about our tangibles, Messy Jesse, all of a sudden, he ain't nowhere to be found. Yeah, controlled opposition. So as you see in the picture, Messy Jesse's in the background. He ain't the one who's got the mic. But do not let anyone tell you that this was the result of anything that he did. Or the result that he... You notice how Big Bird... You know who I'm talking about, that clown from In Cobra. And I know the N stands for nothing, but you notice these morons, notice how these guys, they're not able to be seen right now. That's because they couldn't get out ahead of this one. It's moving faster than their slow behinds like Roly Poly Martin. He never waddled out of that damn soundstage at TV None. He's trying to pretend that he can waddle out of that broom closet, wherever he's gotten, wherever, wherever the hell he does a little streaming from. He's trying to pretend, ah, be -dee -be -dee. I'm out here on the street, be -dee -be -dee, right next to Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles, be -dee -be -dee. and uh, hey, now which one of y'all is throwing rocks at me? Yeah, these old Negroes, these bought and paid for scumbags, these guys are finding that nobody's going to them and waiting to see what they have to say. Because Messy Jesse, he's used to being out front because usually up until now, you've had this attitude of we need to find a leader. The black media said to hell with that. The code is the leader. That's what you should be following. And it's building momentum. Black folks are hearing this and understanding. These Negroes, these sorry bastards that the white media has been putting out there in front of you, these guys have been a huge part of the problem. They're controlled opposition. And as long as you keep following them, that means they control you. So look, we do not wait to see if the white media tells us how we're doing. We got strong minds and we got strong wills. And that being the case, we got the ability to evaluate for ourselves the effectiveness of what it is that we're doing. But just so you understand, the white media sees what's going on. 
They're trying to desperately keep cutting the check out of the discussion. They're trying to limit it to housing vouchers, which go straight to white business interests and what they're seeing as black folks see through the scam. They're trying to redefine reparations and it isn't working, but they're going to keep this up. They're going to keep trying as long as they can, because what they want to find out is if they can give some sense of urgency, phony, false urgency that black folks, you got to accept this now, or this is never going to come again. You better accept this now, or these white supremacist racists are going to get you. You better accept this now. That's what they're trying to do. High pressure sales tactics is what it is. Because once you sign on to the lie that this is what reparations is, now they can say good. In that case, then this is where it stops too, because that's what the plan is. The plan is we're going to have some phony fake voucher program that everyone will be re- will be eligible for, not just you. It can't be just for you. And when you guys sign up for it, the few of you who actually will qualify, because it's not going to be something for all of you, only a small number of you are going to qualify. And if you are one of those lucky few, well, it won't do you no damn good anyway, because the housing costs here are $400,000. Hell, it won't even be enough for a down payment. And even so, if nothing else, this is going to, this is not going to be something that actually changes anything. Which, of course, was the whole idea. Well, the white media can go ahead and keep repeating the lies as much as they want. Black folks ain't listening to them. Oh, sure, we're disgusted by them, but they're not the ones whose word that we take for anything. We're listening to the black media now. And that's the reason why we have made more progress on the issue of tangibles and reparations in the last few years than we made in the last 60 combined. It matters who you listen to. It matters whose voice is in your ear. It matters who you get your news and views from. It matters who influences your sensibilities. It matters.